I think that the biggest challenge is just simply in a macro sense for all the parties that are involved to settle into a long-term uh, context. I use the word context a lot, a long-term context for the adjustment to the relationship. I think one of the biggest mistakes that people can make is to get lost in the tactical issues of the moment because those issues are changing all the time. The other big mistake that I think people can make is to think that there's going to be, you know, some sort of, you know, world changing shift that happens because of Brexit. I see Brexit more as an adjustment than as a, you know, either a wonderful thing or a disastrous thing. It's just part of life. It's an adjustment. And obviously in that adjustment, a lot of businesses sort of wondering how to navigate this space. Do we have an idea of how the UK's small businesses especially are handling this shift? Yes, we are, we are starting to see some direction on that. In the beginning, it was unclear. I mean, we saw the backups of the trucks trying to get across the channel. We saw the confusion. Uh, we saw the problems uh, at the border with just immigration and basic things like, you know, passports and all. But that has started to moderate as, as people start to, you know, figure out, you know, life goes on, as the saying goes. And that, that's true for everyone. I think there are pockets of difficulty, particularly the farmers and the agricultural industry has had a tough time. But there are also pockets of quasi-normalcy. Um, and the financial sector has, has surprised a lot of people um, with its um, quasi-normalcy approach. Taking it in stride would be a good way to think about it. And as you mentioned, some of these uh, frictions, we don't know about the, the UK-France fishing dispute. What is the root cause of this problem, and, and how do you see that being resolved? So, again, in the spirit of context, it's important for us to remember that the Channel Islands, and particularly those of us that don't live in the UK or on the coast of France, the Channel Islands are not technically a separate country. The Channel Islands are, are what's called a crown dependency, crown dependency. And as such, they're affiliated with the UK, um, but they have their own quasi-separate existence at the same time. These islands have a three-mile uh, border in the water and a 12-mile border in the water. And the root cause of the dispute is, does the, does the, do the fishing rights apply to the three mile border or the 12 mile border or something negotiated in between, okay? And because the Channel Islands are UK government entity, Commonwealth, but because they're so geographically close to France, there are legitimate reasons why everybody should be cooperating and sharing. But those legitimate reasons then are not easily translated into sort of geopolitical negotiations. So I think it's going to work out fine. You know, the Channel Islands, you know, have been around for hundreds of years and everybody's worked things out in the past. But the root cause, uh, Rochelle, is this three mile, 12 mile dispute. And, and that's what has to get diplomatically negotiated. And another sticking point, obviously Northern Ireland, um, we're seeing that with, when it comes to the border, that's continuing to be a challenge as they sort of work out the nuances. What issues are currently at play? And do we see some sort of management of solutions in, in the foreseeable future? Well, I think that's a tough one because there is a fundamental contradiction on that border which is um, for purposes of Ireland and Northern Ireland, the border, they want the border to be invisible. I mean, that's a word that my colleagues use. They want it to be invisible, freedom of movement, freedom of every you know, trade off. So the people that live there want the border to be invisible. However, because the UK is, because, because Northern Ireland is UK and, Ireland is EU, politically, it's very important for Northern Ireland not to be a backdoor, unregulated, out of sort of managed access into the EU. Um, and so again, 
as with the, uh, the, the Channel Islands and the fishing, there are legitimate, um, well-intentioned um, positions on both sides, which makes it somewhat difficult to compromise, so to speak. The compromise is harder on that border because you, it is fundamentally inconsistent to have a invisible border and a regulated border. Those two things, Rochelle, cannot coexist without um, some complicated gray area. And nobody's particularly comfortable with gray areas when it comes to borders. So, so you know, people like it to be defined. So that one's going to continue to be a tough one. Uh, but I think with the passage of time, I believe that the practical solution will eventually become the official solution. What I mean by that is the longer it goes on and people figure out how to, how to operate together with this invisible border and regulated border coexisting, as that gray area just happens in real life, I believe that real life will eventually be codified in an agreement. So instead of having an agreement that then enforces real life, I think that situation is going to resolve itself by having real life get codified into an agreement, which is quite a fascinating diplomatic process, different than most diplomatic processes.